Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to ANC 34G's um, special meeting. Um, today is Thursday, April 25th. I uh, will call the meeting to order at 7.04 p.m. And we'll start by doing commissioner introductions for the commissioners that are here. We do have quite a few commissioners that are out, but will be joining us at various parts of the meeting. Um, and as they come online, we'll have them introduce themselves. Um, starting from my uh, left to right, Commissioner Gosselin. Peter Gosselin, I'm the commissioner for uh, District 6, which is largely the west side of Connecticut. Uh, welcome. And I'm Lisa Gore, chair of ANC 34G and commissioner for ANC 34G01, which is all of Hawthorne and portions of Barnaby Woods. Commissioner Lynch. Hi, I'm Peter Lynch. I'm the commissioner for SMD05. Welcome to the meeting. And Commissioner Zeldin. Michael Zeldin, 3G04. And I have the Lafayette School and the immediate environments around it. And Commissioner Nash um, is showing on the line, but I know he's in a meeting, I believe, with um, Commissioner Sherman. It's about the Forest Hills Memory Care uh, facility on Military Road near. Yeah. That they're going to be breaking as soon as possible. Okay. All right. So um, in terms of meeting procedures, they're pretty much the same. Um, we are all virtual right now. We have about 52 people um, in the meeting. If um, you have a comment or you want to speak, we'll ask that you use the raise your hand feature, which is under reactions, the bottom middle of your screen. Um, if you hit the reactions button, you'll see the raise hand feature. Um, when you do that, we'll allow you to speak. We're definitely going to take um, community testimony. Uh, we will um, limit testimony to two minutes. We'll give you a reminder uh, right prior to your two minutes is up. And um, when your two minutes is up, I ask that you let other community members speak. Um, we uh, also remind folks um, that since we have commissioners coming in and out of the meeting, we have to have four commissioners present to take a vote. Um, we don't if we don't have a quorum we can still talk and discuss we just cannot conduct any business um and that's it uh commissioners do you have any changes to the agenda we only have this one item on the agenda which is discuss the possible discussion and possible vote of the resolution concerning the proposed zoning of the um, chevy chase um, or changes to connecticut avenue is there any changes to the agenda as posted Okay. All right. Vote on that. Yep. All those in favor? We didn't really have to vote. <laughs> okay, four zero. Adoption of the agenda. Okay, Commissioner um, Gosselin, do you want to take it from here? You're on mute, Peter. Let me try to catch the community up on where we are. Um, okay. In this meeting, we will have had eight meetings uh, in the last two months. That's more than some ANCs have in a year. Um, we've had four meetings since late March about this issue of the district's proposal to rezone Upper Connecticut Avenue from Livingston Street to the Chevy Chase Circle. Um, we worked at the last meeting last Wednesday on April 17th to try, I worked to try to understand where my fellow commissioners were uh, on this issue. Um, I was left uh, uh, the morning of April 18th um, trying to cobble together a resolution that was my best guess about what could uh, command a, um, a majority. That resolution um, was posted uh, with the, the agenda, and uh, that resolution said that um, called for the support for the OP proposal, or the broad strokes of the OP proposal. That is, two different zones, one for the Connecticut Avenue 
bless the community center library, uh, and then another for the community center library. And for the zone that covered the community center library, um, uh, the OP proposal and this resolution would have supported that proposal, uh, said that the building all in with allowable penthouses and so far could reach 80 feet. In subsequent discussions with fellow commissioners, um, there is a there seems to be uh, still interest in supporting rezoning of Upper Connecticut Avenue, but uh, also concern about the issue of uh, the danger of overdevelopment. And um, a consensus has been forming uh, around uh, a somewhat different um, resolution. A resolution that, that is also posted on the website that calls for a single zone for all of Upper Connecticut Avenue from Livingston Street to the Circle um, with the rules for the rest of Connecticut Avenue zone applying to all of the, uh, the, 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 the commercial corridor. Um, the, the big change here is that that would mean that instead of an 80 foot all in maximum for building height at the community center library that would change to a 70 foot that what we were, we would be endorsing the idea of that changing to a 70 foot um all in height um i can give you more details on that but i i mean i leave it to the chair which we debate first but uh, i i think there's a consensus forming around um the second agenda that i've just described does that uh, sum up where we are? Yes. Um, do you want to, Peter, give them um, a verbal overview of the resolution that's before us? Yeah, let me see. Um, so if people remember the last meeting, um, we talked about two kinds of resolution, um, a process one and a, uh, and a substance one. Um, the resolution before us um, gives a nod to what may subsequently be the process approach we take by saying that we recognize that there were defects in the Zoning Commission's early handling of the proposed changes for Upper Connecticut Avenue, um, including um, its notification of us, uh, of the ANC, and that uh, we uh, may seek, we, we will seek to organize a multi-commission challenge to the Zoning Commission's decision on April 11th to change the procedural rules, interestingly change them in ways that would make, would have made proper the way it handled us when it notified, when it didn't notify us of the proposed zoning change. Um, on the substance, what, uh, what this proposal says um, is that, um, that, I'm going to get my cheat sheet here, is that it says the following. Um, it's the, the ANC supports the major provisions of the proposal for the NMU4 CC1 zone. This is the zone that OP proposes for the rest of Connecticut Avenue, less um, community center library. Um, this is a, this is a, uh, a, uh, it's, this basically says that buildings can be only 40 feet or 50 feet with affordable housing, together with a five foot bonus for large uh, retail space on the ground floor, and then up to a 15 uh, foot penthouse. So that's a 70 foot total all in, as opposed to uh, the current zoning, which is 40, well, 55 feet all in with a penthouse. Um, and it also as opposed to the zone for the community center library, which would be 80 of the, um, so it says that we support the major provisions of the proposal for the rest of Connecticut Avenue zone uh, and the RF zones. These are small parcels, mostly the, in parking lots, um, the, Chev the CVS parking lot, the PNC parking lot, and the back of the Safeway parking lot. These would be zones where there'd be a lot of, where uh, residential housing would be allowed to 35 feet heights. So the proposal is uh, we would support the major provisions of the rest of Connecticut Avenue zone and the RF zones, but reserve judgment for the time being on the proposed maximum floor area ratios, 
side yard requirements and include an inclusion by reference of district parking minimums and maximums. There's a good deal of concern about whether we're providing adequate parking, the, what the OP proposal provides adequate parking. The, 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 the resolution goes on to say, the ANC recognizes that OP has made changes to its proposal for the community center library zone, uh, uh, but it believes that the uh, building height, the proposed building height maximum with permissible penthouses and various height bonuses could result in a building or buildings out of scale with the rest of the com commercial corridor. Therefore, the ANC asked the commission to eliminate the, the, the community center library zone and apply the standards of the rest of Connecticut Avenue uh, zone to the entire uh, corridor from Livingston Street to the Circle. Um, it also, the resolution also includes two more points. It says that the ANC favors ensuring the same amount or more green open space in the Upper Connecticut Avenue commercial corridor to include the square footage of non-parking space at the community center library site, as well as sidewalks and tree boxes along the avenue. It asks the Zoning Commission to add protections in the zoning proposal uh, to protect these spaces. It also says that the ANC recognizes the continuing need, especially among the community's post-65 residents, for vehicle transportation. It asks the Zoning Commission to ensure that adequate parking is available on uh, the Upper Connecticut Avenue corridor. So that's the proposal that that's the what I think is now the consensus proposal, but we'll see in the debate that is to come. Okay. You want to start with, with community? Sure, your, your, your choice. Okay, hang on one minute. Let me get a couple of people at minute. Okay, we're going to go in order um, of hands um, first, Cheryl and Harry Barnes. And before we get started, Commissioner um, Commissioner Nash, thanks for joining. Do you want to do timekeeping? Yes, I, I certainly will. At, uh, at what level? One minute, two minutes, or three minutes? Um, we said two minutes. Okay. Did you call Thank you. Um, two, two points, two quick points, not even one minute. One is um, the 70 foot tall building that Peter is referring to right now conflicts with my memory of the 60 foot building that went in on the ANC 34G resolution. And so I'm trying to figure out at what point did you go back to the community to ask them if now they would prefer a 70 foot building over the 60 foot preference that community expressed earlier. That's point number one. Um, point number two is that um, Chevy Chase Voice filed suit today in yeah. DC Superior Court uh, against uh, the Zoning Commission and um, the, the points of the suit support what Bruce Sherman's points were in the last meeting. And I think what his points this evening may be, I don't know, because I haven't heard them yet, but I just wanted to let the community know that uh, Chevy Chase Voice has filed suit. That's all, thank you. Yeah. If I could just uh, interject here, um, Cheryl, what uh, this proposal does is seek a compromise it basically asks OP and the Zoning Commission to come down 10 feet, and it goes up 10 feet from our last resolution, which was uh, our last resolution, uh, the first time we uh, included the 60-foot uh, max at the Community Center Library was on December 11. So it's a, it is an attempt at a compromise with us giving 10 and us hoping to get but you haven't gone to the community, Peter, is my point. And the majority of the community has already expressed that they don't want development at that site. Dan, but I think that it's an open question how we best achieve protections against um, overdevelopment. Um, it is, 
just saying no is one approach, and I understand that. Uh, another... Public land. It's public land, Peter. It's public sure. land. Cheryl, I let you speak. Try to let me speak. Um, uh, hey, um, excuse me, Peter Goss, important version. Can we just have the community give their statements and not engage in dialogue so we can get through the community statements and have this not last till mm -hmm. 10 o'clock? I mean, we've heard this from Cheryl over and over. She said it again. That's fine. Um, it's her prerogative. Um, let's let's hear from Roger, Robert Gordon, and Ronald Kahn and all the others with their hands up. Then we can discuss it among ourselves in response to all of the community comments. I just don't think we can get through this if you engage in a conversation with every single sure. intervener. Sure. Okay. Are you good with that, Peter? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next um, speaker, Robert Gordon. Hi. Uh, my family owns uh, two shops on the west side of Connecticut Avenue, Little Beast and uh, RT Beast. Uh, we believe, and other store owners believe, that you're looking at the wrong thing entirely. If it's all about height, then uh, you're missing the point. The point is whether it's 50 feet or 60 feet or 70 feet, the building, uh, when the zoning kicks in, will sooner or later be demolished. That'll displace um, mom and pop shops, and there are 40 or 50 of us. And uh, when it's rebuilt in two or three years, rents will be raised. It'll be too much for most of the shopkeepers, the shop owners to afford it. And what you're gonna have is national chain stores coming in and it's gonna change the entire complexion of the city. So you're giving up a, a relatively charming set of stores uh, for a small number of affordable houses. And the city is already incompetent in um, managing its own housing stock. There are thousands of units that are going, that are empty. So I say, don't allow uh, this, this uh, zoning to go through. It's because it's not about height. It's about the character of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ronald Kahn. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I just have a few resolution kind of content concerns. This won't take long. Um, um, as you're aware, there's no mention whatsoever of the survey and the resolution. Uh, why is this a critically important addition? Um, the set down document that the Zoning Commission and the RFP are based upon included many references related to community support. This non-existent fact was critical to the justification of its rulemaking decision. The Zoning Commission took community support as gospel. This needs to be challenged somehow. Um, I've heard more than once also that the survey is in, was inaccurate, that, is, that it somehow underrepresents the housing result. Now, let me offer some objective factors that would cause a much higher non-housing non result. Hopefully, these are not new thoughts to you. Number one, disenfranchisement, the recognition that this was already decided, a top-down result. Why bother with a useless survey? This caused less respondents, a very unhealthy trend. Number two, significant campaign to discredit our community, if not supporting housing. This caused a higher number of residents to enter a housing preference. The, campa the campaign included many letters form letters to including non-residents. These are these are factual reasons why the survey was as close as it was. I want you to consider that if you haven't. I'm hoping you have. Um, and um, I think the um, you know the survey supports a factless result basically promoted by OP dump ed and blindly followed now by the zoning commission. Okay. Uh, second one, um, can you kill the RF the RF1 uh, content from now I'm shifting subjects. I, it's not in the RFP or the SAP. Two and, minutes are up. Okay, at least I need to fully understand its impact um, and purpose and rationale. So I'm asking you if you can sidebar that 
for another time. I, I, I think it's important enough to separate that, and it's kind of news to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. Um, let's go to Brian. And and actually, I would gladly uh, wave my time to uh, to Ronald Kahn if he had additional comments. But uh, my <laughs> I, um, yeah. okay. my my generally, I support uh, Ronald Kahn's comments. Um, I feel that, in fact, you know, this ANC has been in a very difficult position. Um, you know, there has been heavy pressure applied from the executive. And it's interesting to me um, that uh, at the DEMPED uh, uh, March Madness event, in fact, uh, Gilles Stucker uh, had just enormous praise for you, Lisa Gore, as chair in pushing forward uh, the DEMPED request. Um, but I think with Elizabeth, like, Elizabeth, you got to cut uh, going. Yeah. Here. yeah. With Brian, regard to the upcoming zoning commission hearing, I think it's important for this body to consider asking the commission to split the two considerations of the civic core parcel from uh, the rest of Connecticut Avenue and not simply to endorse one height restriction. There are different considerations, in my opinion. Uh, what constitutes appropriate use of the community center um, is quite different than uh, the rest of the upper six blocks of, of Connecticut. And the district is asking the Zoning Commission to approve something that's never been done before in the district, and that is housing on top of a community center or housing in shared space with a playground and community center. And I want you to envision for just a minute that the Forest Hills Playground and Park had a housing development on top of it. So there are certainly other cases. Chevy Chase would be the first that this is uh, being asked of. And I think it deserves special attention and careful weighing of what the implications are um, and splitting the two cases. So that would be my request to this true. body. Thank you. Okay, Carol. Yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this meeting. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I just would like to say that all these years, no one's built up to what current current zoning allows. So why don't we let that development occur first? What is current, current zoning would allow to build up to 50 feet, something like that? I mean, why don't we let that happen first? Otherwise, it will be too much of a shock to the community. And then if in another 20 years they want to build even taller, they can maybe come up with a proposal to upzone then. What I'd like to say is that these new zones will render our downtown Chevy Chase utterly unrecognizable. It will be absolutely shocking. How is that fair when the majority of residents have expressed that they don't want such intense development here? 70% Oppose such uh, opposed buildings greater than 60 feet tall. That was the result in your ANC survey. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Butler. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I just quickly want to say that um, speaking for our Win More Through Affordable Housing uh, congregations, we don't believe that the majority of people in Chevy Chase oppose housing and redevelopment of the Civic Corps. Our door knocking tells us otherwise. Um, we think people, in fact, are interested in a redeveloped library, state-of-the-art community, community center, and appropriate housing. Number two, this is not top-down. This started years ago with Randy Speck. There was community involvement back then. There were commissioners in support of it. <laughs> There was community participation in the small area plan. It's unfortunate that people who spoke up then didn't get their way and therefore maintain that there was no input, but it existed for those of you who spent time in all those Zoom meetings. Um, and I think that in order for us to have what we need for affordable housing at the site, we have to look at taller heights. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Andrea. 
I don't see the utility or the reasoning behind backing away from the ANC's two earlier resolutions that called for a 60-foot building on the uh, Chevy Chase comp uh, sorry, Commons. Um, you're compromising against the community with the mayor, and that doesn't feel good to me. Moreover, I doubt you can apply the same CC1 zone to that's used on the corridor to the Chevy Chase Commons and then try to add in other attributes like preservation of green space and surface parking. I think they have to be two separate zones regardless. Um, the civic core will become part of the blanket rulemaking if you try to put it all under the same <laughs> zone when it definitely should be a contested case. And if this compromise among ANC members requires the ANC to land on a 70 foot building height, which is notably departs from the results of the valid ANC survey. Then I would urge the ANC to not submit a resolution at all, but to weigh in as residents like the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle Wolin. Um, first of all, I, Jamie, I guess we're going to have this back and forth all the time. I, too, knocked on a lot of doors with our with our first petition, which was also ignored. Um, what was it now two years ago? I spoke to a lot of people. Uh, I, the most I ever had on any given day was one or the most I ever had was two people supporting putting housing here. Usually it was zero or one compared to 10 to 12 people who didn't want it. But secondly, this idea that people had input before is just simply not true. Not hardly. When I asked people, have you heard about the SAP? No one had. And very, Rand, uh, the, Randy Speck wanted this to happen along with Ward 3 Vision and Win. And the fact that they never went to the community, despite the 2018 to 2020 uh, ANC saying when they first presented race community findings, they were like, we are going, this is just the beginning. And your community group said they were going to do a survey. And uh, the housing group all said, don't worry, we're going to have so much more engagement. We're going to do a survey. That never happened. The 2020 to 2022 ANC never did anything to outreach to the community. And you knew how controversial this was. It took three years to get a survey. And when we discussed the survey, Ward 3 Vision and Randy Speck were apoplectic over doing a survey. And then when it became obvious you were still going to do a survey, they were like, don't ask about housing. Don't ask about housing. So they knew the community didn't want this. And your 2019 survey listed affordable housing. I believe it was 18 out of 20 things in order of importance. And this is backed up by this current survey, which went to every single household. So please don't say that what is reflected in this survey isn't true. And again, everyone had the chance to weigh in. Many people don't care one way or the other, all right? And they, whatever. But you've never had results this big. Two minutes. 2,900 people. You cannot ignore this. Um, <laughs> Ron and Carol, if you can do me a favor and lower your hand since you guys have already spoke one round. It's kind of messing up the order on the screen. But um, let me go to Christopher Vaden. Thank you. I, I wanted to encourage the um, commission to um, go back to thinking about Commissioner Gosselin's first draft, not his second resolution. Um, I, I know there are people who are not going to be satisfied with any uh, increase, uh, any upzoning, any increase in density. But I, I did want to make the point that um, the Civic Corps site really for economic reasons is the most feasible place to put affordable housing. And by reducing the overall height limit from OP's 80 feet to the 70 feet of a single zone, you cut out an entire floor of housing at that site. And I just think that's a big loss. I also have to, to kind of agree with part of what Andrea Rosen was saying about how you really need two separate zones. The OP proposal very specifically has a smaller lot occupancy limit for the civic core in order to ensure the green space there is preserved. The rest of the zone does not have that. If And I realize that Commissioner Gosselin put in some, some 
vague general language about preserving green space along the corridor, but I don't think that accomplishes what people really want to accomplish in terms of saving open and green space at the civic core. So I, I really think the, the Commissioner Gosselin's original draft is um, uh, much closer to something that makes sense and, and frankly, much closer to um, you know what, what's in the comp plan and the small area plan. I don't know how you would explain um, uh, a, any of the other ideas we've heard tonight as, as being consistent with those documents. And the Zoning Commission is going to have to come up with ultimately zoning that is consistent with those. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I just make one point. Um, actually, the residential lot occupancy for, C, uh, for the rest of Connecticut Avenue uh, is the same, 60%. What percentage did you say, Peter? The 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 residential lot, lot occupancy for the, the 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 first the rest of Connecticut Avenue zone is a, as it is with the OP's community center zone sixty percent. Okay, um, Christopher, do you have a different understanding? Um, I would. Um... I would have to look at the documents. I, I'm surprised to hear that, but I, I can't say that I know otherwise. I, I'm looking at the document right now. It, it says existing MU3A, lot occupancy residential max 60%, MU4, 60%, 75% with IZ, and then this proposed NMU4CC1, 60%, 75% with IZ, and then the civic site is 60%. There's no lot occupancy requirement for non-residential uses, which means the ground floor of uh, the CC1 uh, zone can be 100% occupied by a building. So if you apply the CC1 to the civic core- but Point of order, point of order. Wait a minute, okay. let him get there. Um, no, I, I'm I sorry. It, go it, in order of the people that have raised their hands. Yeah, well, we've all kind of jumped in here. So we're, we're commissioners. <laughs> we're we're clarifying, clarifying, clarifying questions. Um, okay, Ron, did you have anything else? No, I just wanted to clarify the facts of of, of the zoning. It, it, you know, theoretically, you could build the entire uh, ground floor of uh, uh, of any uh, CC point of order. One zone. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Um, Elizabeth? Elizabeth Nagy? You're still muted, Elizabeth. Let's go to um, Corinthia, then come back to Elizabeth when she gets her text straight. Corinthia? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, um, I mentioned this last meeting, but I just want to ask the ANC Commission to please not pose a resolution that can, um, has any reference to Chevy Chase Voice. They're not an ANC sponsored organization, so I, I don't I don't think that's appropriate. Um, next, I just would like to um, ask the Commission. As they're going through, you know, development and determining heights to please consider and think about Washington, D.C. as a whole. Chevy Chase is not a village. We don't have a downtown. We have a business district. And then the last thing I just want to point out, I moved to Chevy Chase in 2020, spent most of my time living in Washington, D.C. in Ward 5. When I moved to Chevy Chase, I had lived in Texas for nine months almost a year or so. And I participated in the Office of Planning process that they had. Fresh to this community, I was able to find out about it. I participated in all those meetings and Zoom meetings and putting stickies on the board. So I just wanna point out that the community did participate. We had an opportunity to participate. And when we're talking about the majority of the community, the majority of the community are not on the call because we have young kids and we're busy. That's all, thank you. Okay, thanks, Corinthia. 
Um, Elizabeth, are you back on? I am. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. That's I okay. always seem to not be able to find how to unmute myself, which is different from other people who do seem to unmute themselves. Anyhow, um, I just wanted to point out that affordable housing has not panned out on the Washington, the Wisconsin Avenue corridor near Friendship Heights. Um, that was supposed to have a lot of affordable housing, and it doesn't. I think that it's questionable whether we'll have affordable housing at the Commons if this goes through. Um, and uh, for that, I would point to the fact that the RFP doesn't require housing on the common site at all. It allows for all kinds of other different uses and it doesn't specifically require housing affordable or otherwise at the common site. So I understand that people want affordable housing. I get it, I agree, but I don't think this is how it's going to happen. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. And Susan P. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to remind all of you, this is going to be your legacy. This is what Washington's going to remember you for. And if we end up, which I think we will, in five, six years with a massive development with tiny space dedicated to the library and inadequate community center, no surface parking, your legacy is going to be giving away public land to private developers. My guess is that we won't end up with more than three or four affordable housing units. We are a small city. Our land isn't growing. You are entrusted with the public good. I was born in D.C., not in Ward 3. I grew up in Shepherd Park, and I'm old enough that it was before there was a Shepherd Park library. And I know that people came from all over the city to the Chevy Chase Library for two reasons. One, easy free parking. Two, it was safe and open late. So I grew up always going there, sometimes to Petworth, but mostly there. And now that um, I've had an accident this year and I can't walk to the library anymore. So the surface parking is very important to me. I, I use the library because I can drive and park there. And I see a lot of senior citizens from all over the city and people with restricted mobility who are able to use public facilities because of the ease of access. And none of the other libraries close to us have this. these. I would also like to remind you that other libraries around the city were developed without turning over precious public space to private developers for private use and private enrichment. If the mayor truly believes this is the only option for affordable housing in Ward 3, which it isn't because there's affordable housing planned now on Wisconsin Avenue that's already appropriately zoned for it. If she believes it's the only option, then I say we- Two minutes are up. City money for public land and make all the housing only public housing, affordable housing. Don't give away a public good to private developers. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Uh, okay, before we go into, there's certain um, community members that have already spoken that have their hands raised. So that would be a round two. Um, I wanna go back to commissioners and see if you have any, um, any comments or statements regarding what we've heard so far from the community. Commissioner Gosselin. I, a couple of things. I think Ron Kahn's comment about the survey results being um, pointed to in this resolution makes sense, and I'd be happy to add them. Um, uh, if there's a concern about the, the difference on non-residential uh, with regard to the, 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 the one zone approach, um, I'd be I'm happy with mention of the of a 60% overall for um, the community center library thing. And to the last speaker, Susan, um, uh, we understand that parking is very important. Um, you have to understand here that we're talking about zo zoning um, and not the community center library RFP. Um, uh, I, we say in this, as I cited, that we recognize the need, the continuing need for uh, vehicle transportation, 
Um, we, we reserve the right to comment later on the sort of pouring over from uh, other uh, DC rules about the, the uh, parking maximums and so forth. But we, we advocate for adequate parking all up and down the avenue. Um, those are my comments on testimony so far. Um, okay, let me go to Commissioner Lynch. I, I can save my comment for, for later. Okay. Commissioner Nash. I wanted to respond to uh, two somewhat contradictory comments about uh, affordable housing in, uh, well, either Ward 3 or west of the park. One person said there's plenty of it. And I think another person said it's not working out the way it, uh, it was supposed to over uh, in uh, Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, and so, you know, you could argue this. I guess, I guess people can argue it uh, both ways. Uh, we're, we shouldn't try to get affordable housing because it never happens, or we shouldn't try to get it because it's happening everywhere else. Uh, that's illogical to me. But one thing that I, I do know from the uh, website that is referenced in this uh, resolution, west of the park is one of 10 regions in D.C., that uh, the mayor has set 2025 targets for affordable housing. West of the park is by far the worst performer. We have uh, gotten to 10% of the 2025 goals by building 200 affordable units. The closest uh, non-performer to us is Capitol Hill, and they're more than twice as close to the goal as we are. They're over 20%. If we put one, even 100 affordable units in the civic core, that's 50% uh, of what we of what's the total now. That is a, a significant contribution. Two minutes. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair call out, uh, Bruce. And and just yes. to re just to reiterate that commissioners, uh, definitely keep your comments to two minutes. You can time yourself if you want. <laughs> okay, well, um, as many people on the call know, certainly the commissioners know. For those on the call who don't know, my position as a commissioner is to represent the views of my constituents, not my own. And I do everything I possibly can to understand what their views are. Uh, I do everything I possibly can to inform them as to the issues through my weekly newsletter and routine engagement in the community with, uh, with my constituents. So for the purposes at hand, I feel that a new survey this week, which asks specifically about uh, the zone that runs the length of Connecticut Avenue, the corridor from Livingston Street to Chevy Chase Circle, uh, that is the zone NMU-4CC1. Um, and I asked, in fact, if they supported uh, the proposal by the city that would allow buildings up to 70 feet in height with 75% lot coverage. Um, those results have come in. The survey is still open. Uh, I've received all told nearly 400 responses. 254 of those, or about two-thirds, have come from my single-member district. Uh, to be clear, when you put a public survey out, the URL gets shared, other people take the survey, I ask people to indicate where they resided so that I could differentiate, filter the data. The results are 61% of my constituents opposed the zoning, rezoning, 33% supported it. Those results largely mirror the responses that I received, we received, for my single member district, nearly 500 responses in total to the fall survey. So on two separate occasions now, uh, very significant amounts of data uh, I have regarding my constituents' views. Uh, and I uh, have said that I would pledge to honor their views, uh, and, and, and so I will. But I wanted to share that information with you because I think it's significant and it's important to continue to ask people where they are on these issues. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Michael Zeldin. So I wanted to just respond to a few comments. Um, I, I have concerns about development in our neighborhood 
from the standpoint of the impact that uh, new construction will have on businesses to uh, Robert Gordon's point and to the impact additional students will have on Lafayette. I am not unmindful of them and I wish there was a more coherent understanding of what the city's plan is for the ancillary damage that development or ancillary impact that um, development will, will have. And I think that's something that we as a community need to address. And we talked about this before about some sort of rent subsidies or dispositions of some sort for existing businesses to be able to stay in business. But the point I really wanted to address was some of the comments about what new development might look like. We we were asked by the OANC to talk to some of the prospective um, bidders, and I did so. And in looking at the plans, they wouldn't show me the exact plans, but in looking at the plans and discussing with them, each of them provided for parking, uh, one level down parking, 70 parking spots was one compared to the 26 we have now. So more than double the amount of of parking. Second, the amount of open space um, was substantially increased because the parking would go underneath where the um, parking lot is now. And that parking lot would then become part of the open space of the, the plan. Um, from an environmental standpoint, one of the developers said they don't intend to put on a um, cap a, a penthouse because they want to have the roof be um, solar. So to generate the power for the community the center by solar. So there are a lot of things that people are saying that they are assuming when in speaking to the developers, prospective developers, all of those things are addressed and uh, take account completely of more, more need for open space, more need for parking, larger um, uh, opportunities for participation by the community senior centers and and uh, even an auditorium for community meetings so we can actually be meeting in person where there is a sound system that, that works. So I don't think people should be so careful. I think people have to be more careful about saying what this won't involve when they haven't seen any of the plans that these prospective developers are talking about. And the two that I spoke to both respect, both project 100% affordable housing in the 30 to 60 um, median family income range. That's what I have to say. And I think I'm gonna have to get off the phone in a minute to do my TV and then I'll try to come back. Okay. Can, I just, can I just say kind of as a point of order, Michael, I, I appreciate all that, but um, the community is not privy to any conversations with bidders. We understand that there's going to be uh, a disposition hearing where Proposals vetted by DEMPED are presented to the community for the community's review and the community's input. Um, so as much as I myself have a kind of an interest in an early heads up on what developers might have in mind, uh, it's very premature, it seems to me, to be mentioning these things, particularly in the light of if we only knew how wonderful it would be, we would all drop any concerns about what we're talking about now. So I'm just that's not that's Bruce. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there no, are surveys how, to be taken. That's how I heard it. OK, well, let me try to make it clear. There are surveys like the Trammell Crow um, proposal has a um, survey on its thing. You put your telephone against that little skew thing and, and you get it. And they are trying to take account of uh, the communications. I think all of the. Um, people who are bidding are, are happy to talk to community members. All I'm saying, Bruce, is that when people propose theoretical horribles, if we build this, we will lose this, we will lose that, we will that. All I'm saying is that's not fact-based, that's fear-based. And all I'm trying to say is in my conversation with some of these developers, which is something that all of us are free to do, they are suggesting that these fear-based um, observations of people are not fact-based. Well, that's all, all I'm trying to do is to say, when you say I'm fearful that we won't have affordable housing, the two uh, developers that I spoke to said we're, gonna, we're seeking 100% affordable housing. When you say I'm fearful that we have no parking, 
The two that I spoke to said we're having underground parking and we're going to more than double the number of spaces. When you say I'm fearful that we will not have green space, the two that I spoke to are going to have substantially additional green space. So all I'm saying is there are facts that, that underline and then there are fears that underline. And that's what I'm suggesting. And Michael, all I'm suggesting is that we won't know anything for sure until the disposition hearing. Oh, well, and and actually, I, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to it being um, a contested hearing, as you and I have spoken. No, about. but I mean, until, no. What I mean by that is when when the vetted proposals come to us from DEMPED, and the bidders themselves make their presentations to the community, at that point we will know what it actually is in the offing. That's all I'm is trying to establish here. Okay, let me. Uh, and let I was me just trying back. to give people a heads up. Let me go back, um, commissioners. So we will know something, Bruce, ahead of the disposition hearing. And I'm assuming you're talking about the council hearing. We absolutely will know something way before. Sorry, to be clear, I'm talking about, I, I had a long conversation with Jill Stucker about this last week. And what I understand happens is they receive the proposals from the bidders. They ensure that all the proposals meet the requirements. And then there is an opportunity, as they have pledged to us that there would be, for the community to see what the bidders are presenting. Now right. that's, and yeah. that's prior to the disposition here. That's all I'm trying to say. Right. Because you right. said at the disposition here, it is prior to the disposition here. But he called uh, it, he called it a, a disposition. That, that, that was his term. But okay, it, it's part of the process, but it is prior to the disposition hearing, which is a council hearing. Well, no question about that. I'm talking about when we get to see the proposals, and that's where right. we know what, what people are presenting. We don't, well, we don't, you know. Let me just add, um, I was going to comment on the same thing that Michael Zeldin commented on, and I, I don't want the meeting to get sidetracked in, into the RFP because we are here to talk about the zoning. Um, but one of the things that we talked about as a, as a commission is being transparent with what we are hearing from developers if we interview with developers or if we talk about them. So I do not think it is inappropriate for Commissioner Zeldin or any commissioner on the commission. And as a matter of fact, we agree at each meeting if we talk to developers to, to, to share those conversations with the community. So it's not, and it, I think it's important that the community knows it's not written in stone, but these are some of the things that some of the development teams have told us that, you know, the parking, some, de some development teams absolutely have plans that double the parking, way more than we have there. Some development teams have plans for 100% affordable. Th that's just a fact of what some of the development teams are talking to us about. So at, as those conversations go on, we should share that with the community so that there might be some alleviation of some of the fears to at least know that the develop, and I, I can tell you from the conversation I had with one of the development teams, they looked at the survey, they looked at everything and they were, they were darn serious about trying to meet some of those demands. So I think it's appropriate for us to share that. But um, let me go on to Commissioner Lynch. Then I wanna go back to the community, there's a few community members that have not spoken. And then there's um, some community members that will go on a second round and we'll just have two rounds. So Commissioner Lynch, then Gosselin. Yeah, I was just gonna say that we, I, I thought we agreed to go all community, then commissioners and, and we've gone to the back and forth. So I hope we go to the community and then have our discussion. Thank you. Yeah, we are. Commissioner Lynch, I mean, um, Gosselin, did you have your hand? of is a practical concern, which is that Zach, we're going to have a, a quorum and perhaps more than a quorum when we come to, when, you know, if we're going to take up a vote uh, tonight. So I don't know where, is Zach on? Yep, I'm here. Okay. You have an outside time by which you have to, and you're going to vote to put people to bed. Uh, I can um, speak now, but I, you know, I don't mind if um, y'all have to vote while I'm gone. You know, I, I would like to attend the vote, um, but you know, um, I, I don't want to single-handedly hold up a commission, so um, you know, I'll, I'll try to make it here. But um, please, do. I mean, I just think uh, having a full or almost full commission. Um, I, yeah. so, um, I thought Zach said that uh, <laughs> at eight thirty he might have to leave us. So eight thirty, I I would prefer we get our vote by eight thirty. Definitely. Uh, 
Um, so uh, Commissioner Ferguson, did you want to talk now or after the second round of community comments? Uh, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. So let's go back to community. Um, and I think the first person that had not spoken before is um, Libby Martin, then Elizabeth McPike, and Robin Miles McLean. Libby? Hi. Thank you, everybody, for. You are mute. Oh, dude. Let's do this. I can hear you. No, now uh -oh. you're. Libby? <laughs> Now you are. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Um, thank you, commissioners, for your work. And uh, just to, I have a couple points. Um, I want to caution the assumptions uh, once again that uh, certain groups are representative of the majority of the neighborhood. Um, I, it's not because there are the most people that show up from a particular group on the screen, that means that they are representative of the voice of the community. And in the same vein, um, the survey that Commissioner Sherman just referenced, um, it's not because there are X number of responses in, in, a, in a, to a two-question survey that that is representative of the neighborhood either. Um, anybody who wants to take that survey via email can. And I don't know how you cross reference e email addresses or whatever, but I think that's that's it's problematic to make any kind of assumptions about that. Um, somebody referenced the legacy to our uh, future here. And it's exactly because of the legacy of this community that I do support the changes that were uh, called for in the small area plan and the comprehensive plan, which are based on policy that is based on the needs of our fellow citizens and as well as people who are workforce, seniors, families who uh, could live in this neighborhood. Uh, and certainly the fact that Rock Creek West has definitely the least amount of affordable housing uh, in the city, given the huge goals that we need to attain to improve the situation for housing, you know, our, our, our neighborhood has a great opportunity to do the right thing on the, and, and, and leave a good legacy. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that it's also, um, I contest the fact that no one was informed about these things a while ago. I mean, I, as a very individual, simple resident with no affiliations, listened to, went to the meetings um, in 2020 at the community center, just by myself out of curiosity and started learning that way. And that's how I followed the whole Time's development up. plan. Okay. Let me um, just caution um, committee community members on the rules of the meeting. Uh, I will definitely ask you, please don't holler out to fellow people. Um, we have given everyone a little extra leeway with their time. And I ask that you do the same thing. All right. Um, let's see. Who was next? Um, Robin, I believe. Robin Miles? Yes, Robin Miles okay. McLean. I just yeah. want to yeah. take a moment to talk about the parking and the disability issue. Peter Goslin, I appreciate you speaking to that, but you mentioned you're thinking about the 65 plus who are disabled. Um, and God bless you if you make it to 65 without having mobility or disability issues. I am not yet 65. I've been disabled since I was 32. Uh, my son, who lives in our house, is 35. He's been disabled since he was 10. Uh, it's great that developers are saying in private meetings that there will be more parking. Uh, there's nothing to hold them to that uh, promise or wish or whatever you want to call it. Um, and who are those parking spaces going to be for? Um, the residents of the building or the people that are going to the library? And if parking is indeed a priority, why is the ANC okay with giving away three parking spaces? 
uh, the parking lots, um, which were, and I have been, my husband and I have been in all the meetings and I have all the notes to prove it. The, all those uh, RF1 spots, the community has said no to repeatedly. And as recently as March 30th, Lawson of the Office of Planning said, oops, sorry, we didn't mean to put those in there again. We'll take those out. We thought the community wanted them. We made it perfectly clear that that had not been the feeling of the community, including those of us who live right behind those spots. And we were told by Lawson that those would be removed. And yet not only are they part of the planning, uh, the ANC resolutions uh, all are in support of them. So I don't see anywhere mm -hmm. in this lift service that anyone is actually paying any attention to disability, parking, accessibility. And like I said, God bless you all for not being disabled yet. But it's going to happen to a lot of people. And I, like I said, every time I come to these meetings and these come, these we've lived here for 30 years. And I feel like at the end of the meetings, I'm inconvenient. The fact that I won't ever be able to use a bicycle lane makes me inconvenient. Um, and I really don't appreciate it. Thank you, Robin. Robin, we can hear uh, your uh, pain and, and, and emotion and, and, and sorry you're going through that and feeling that way. Thank you. But you know, in part, I we picked this house because I was disabled and the accessibility that it afforded. And that this planning process is a lot about taking that away it is very distressing. My son was not disabled when we moved here. He was disabled in an accident at Wilson High School pool. And yet we still love this community. We still live in this community. Our children all went to DCPS schools. So I don't wanna hear that I am against development because I just want to keep things the same or because I don't understand. You know, I worked for the Environmental Protection Agency before I was disabled. That's actually how I got disabled, going to a conference to support, guess what, the Clean Air Act and the discussion of, of housing and transportation planning. My reservations are not inconsidered uh, nor parochial. And I, I really am tired of uh, those concerns being colored in that way. Thank you, Robin. Um, and hopefully that's not the impression that we've given you tonight. If so, my deepest apologies, because I don't think individually that's the way the commissioners feel. Okay, Michaela. Michaela Platzer. Uh, yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, just really quickly, I just wanted to um, echo what Mr. Gordon from Little Beast said. Um, I think um, we really have to take the small business community's point of view in mind. If we, um, because of this uh, change in zoning, if we lose all those small businesses, we're going to, that's going to diminish our quality of life. I think it's very important to have things like Little Beast, to have a dry cleaner, to have a shoe repair, and so on. But as he um, noted, if you um, raise those rents, all of those places are going to go out of business. We've already noted, we can already see what's going to happen. Look at Friendship Heights. They used to have some small stores up there. For the most part, they're all gone. And um, if we go down the same path, we're going to lose all of those shops. And I think there are a lot of people who moved into this neighborhood because of um, because of being able to access those kind of stores. So I just really think people should not lose sight of Mr. Gordon's point and what this could do and how this might devastate our commercial core. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Who else has not spoken? 
Elizabeth Nagy? Claudia, Claudia Russell, I don't believe, has spoken yet. Yeah, but I think Elizabeth was first, and definitely Claudia. Um, I'm, I'm happy to defer to Claudia at the moment. I do want to say something, but I can wait. Okay, Claudia. Um, I apologize. I was in another meeting, and so I hope I don't uh, repeat things or whatever. But anyway, I am truly concerned about the street walls that are being created by the Heights and by the assumption that there can be very large penthouses. Um, penthouses are based on the relationship of the parapet or edge of building to the face of penthouse. So if you have 20 foot setback, you can have a 20 foot penthouse. It's adding a tremendous amount of height. Um, I'm also worried about the measuring points. The measuring point is can be the middle of any of the streets. And of course we've got the hill on McKinley that I've heard through discussion is 15 or 16 feet. So that's almost another story. I think it's really important to look at the quality that we are developing with a street wall of this height um, we will lose light. We've talked about this before. Uh, green space, as much as people say we're getting it, it will not develop well in a shadow of a tall building. Um, and the qualities of which would make it a wonderful open space for the public would not be there. But even stepping back further, I was at a meeting last night and we're very much aware that the vacancy rate of office is 22%. Uh, last night, they said that the vacancy rate of first floor retail is 25%. And I worry that we're focusing perhaps on the wrong heights and things to change to make more affordable housing when downtown is emptying out. It's gonna be like the MLK donut where people move to the perimeter and left the, the middle vacant. And I, I would like to think that we could look at this in a bigger picture, where we really need to provide housing and where we can reduce the height to make it more manageable for a neighborhood that is residential. Um, where I call it the, we're gonna have the unwelcome wall when you come out of Chevy Chase Circle from a low rise residential to, you know, up to 80, 90 feet, whatever it is with mm -hmm. the penthouses. And I think it's really important to look at the quality and then say, are we misplacing all the emphasis when we're seeing downtown in, in a state that, according to this professor from the University of Maryland, we have not even seen the bottom of it. So I hate to be the dismal news uh, person, but I think the energy to put something so large in our neighborhood is misspent when downtown is in need and we certainly can make it all work. We just don't need a street wall that blocks our light and changes the character of our neighborhood and the sociability of our neighborhood, which we learned is really critical, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, she dropped off. Okay, so we're going to go Steve Connors, and then we'll go back to um, the folks that had um, spoken prior. Steve? Steve? Okay, let me go back to the round one folks, Carol, and I'm just going across the screen. Mm. Yes, hi. So I would like to reference what uh, Commissioner Zeldin had uh, talked about regarding fact-based, what is fact-based and what is fear-based. Well, certainly what is fact-based is that any developer who builds on Connecticut Avenue or on the commons is going to build to the maximum height and mass that they possibly can. I've never met a developer who did not build to the max ever. So that is fact-based. Uh, but what I really wanted to say is that we, we vote for president in this country 
And those who don't vote or bother to vote, they don't get a say. Um, the ANC had a survey. The majority didn't want surplusing or housing on the commons or overdevelopment on Connecticut Avenue. We had a survey, people voted and the ANC, please respect the survey. Please represent your constituents. Thank you. Jamie Butler. Yeah, I want to just quickly follow up on Michael Zeldin and um, um, somebody, oh, Lisa, your comments. Um, Winmore 3 has met with all the development groups. And um, I really recommend you all do the same. They're all listed on the Denpen website. You can get their contact information. They're looking for input from people. There is a non-for-profit housing developer, Arlington Partners for Affordable Housing, who are submitting. There are other nonprofit developers who do affordable housing only, who are teaming with other groups. There are exciting proposals. One is going to build to 65 height, as Peter or somebody else mentioned. There are very creative proposals out there with better green space than we have now. Those of you who are opposed to this, okay, don't bother to look into it. But for those of you who are questioning and hearing all of these scare stories, contact them and listen to what they have to say. They're all not going to build luxury housing. And in fact, it is easier to build all affordable housing and to get financing for it than to include market rates. So I don't think we have to be worried about luxury apartments at the Civic Corps. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Max. Uh, Michelle Wolin. Okay, I, I just want to respond to a few things. Um, echoing Robin, it, it is, we do need to know who the parking is for, because I think the RFP didn't uh, really provide much for patrons of the Library and Community Center. With respect to the open space that Michael was talking about, the parking lot right now is an asphalt parking lot. <laughs> um, the green space includes the green part, which is mature trees. Um, if you care about the environment, nothing captures carbon like mature trees. And if they do underground parking, and if you know they build a whole whatever, most of that lot is going to be bulldozed. I mean, there's some talk of maybe saving the big tree in the corner. Of course, what happens sometimes, the roots get damaged during construction, so it may die anyway. But it's not just open space. You know, people want the trees and the green. And it will take years, 20 to 30 years. You could say, well, they can plant something as long as they don't make it all concrete, like what you have at Friendship Heights on the corner, which is a very uninviting space. It's an urban plaza. Um, it will take 20 or 30 years for those trees to get any height. Right now there is shade, you hear birds. It is really pleasant. I actually saw a couple last fall taking wedding pictures there. They drove up in a limo. I was like, wow, they must have met at the library. Um, you know, it's actually, it's a very pleasant place. It, it's a little respite from the rest of Connecticut Avenue. I see people having picnics there in the summer with their kids. It's really quite nice. You take down most of the trees, which is gonna happen in this you know, in this film, it, it loses its whatever. Um, Secondly, uh, with respect, yes, people last few years with OP, they did, and I'm not saying no one knew what was going on, but I have a small area plan right here. Um, they had 100 participants at the community walks, 200 at the virtual visioning workshop. You know, a lot of them were the same. They had an online visioning survey. That was the, their most intense. That was 568. And I remember in that survey, it was basically like, this is what we're gonna do. What do you think? There was no place to say you didn't want housing. Anyway, that at 568 compared to 2,300 responses to the ANC survey, four times as much. And I agree, at any given meeting, it depends on who comes there. You, you know, one group may be represented and another group not so much. But that is why the ANC survey was so valuable. Not only is it a huge number, 2,300, it was sent to every household everyone had the chance to participate. And with, res I'm sorry, with respect to Mr. Nash talking about the um, amount of affordable housing, I mentioned to him, I saw him about a month ago, he didn't know that all the projects that are already planned for Friendship Heights, Tenley, the Wardman, they already, they will have affordable housing. I'm giving them a short part. The Wardman's gonna have 72, Tenley lumping everything together. There'll be at least 139. 
friendship, there will be 205 affordable units, and that is not including Lord & Taylor or WMATA, whichever one becomes housing. And we're all forgetting the GSA site on Nebraska Avenue, which is going to be an amazing opportunity, I, I, assuming the district gets it. That's a large piece of land. And as Claudia mentioned, downtown desperately needs housing. And if you live downtown, you have access to lots of metro stops, lots of buses, transportation's a lot better. Remember, our area with all this added density, we're not on a metro. So it's gonna add cars. Um, and, and Walter Reed also mentioned that's gonna have 2,100 housing units with over 400 affordable. There is a ton of housing being built here. And with all these new residents, they're gonna want public space. They're gonna want outdoor recreation space. Why are we giving up our public land? What are we gonna do when there are more demands for it? Go buy some private property? <laughs> Maybe let's wait and see what happens with all these new residents coming in. Public land is valuable and it's a need for the community to have parks, to have recreation, a summer camp for kids, a, a, a play group that they have every weekday morning for preschoolers. That stuff matters. I'm done. Okay. Um... Claudia Russell. Claudia. Okay, let's go to Christopher Vaden. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address the point about small businesses on the avenue, which I think all of us cherish. Um, Jerry Mallett's newsletter earlier this month listed about 20 small businesses that we've lost over the last 20 years or so, and that's without any development. And I think part of the problem is that in a low density residential zone, you don't have enough people within walking distance of your business often. Uh, to provide a very solid customer base. And it seems to me that adding more housing along the avenue uh, by, by adding affordable housing and, and, and maybe some, you know, apartments over Safeway or whatever ends up getting, being, uh, getting developed is going to strengthen our small business base, not threaten it. So I, I don't, I, I think the argument we've heard is exactly backwards. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Steve Connors. Yeah, I just, uh, sorry about it. I was muted earlier. I didn't, couldn't get off of it in time, but yeah, I, I share, oh. um, I share uh, the points about the measuring points and how that's all going to be actually measured. I know there are some people that say it's already, you know, it's very easy to figure out, but I, there are just too many discrepancies and too many different uh, heights being thrown about. Uh, parking underground. Um, <clears throat> I could be wrong, but I'm not sure that most people would like to have parking underground, um, particularly some of the older people, given the fact that it might not be well maintained, well lit. If there's an elevator there, will that be will that be fixed? Who's going to maintain it? All that kind of stuff. Um, I do agree with Sue P about the legacy of this vote and what's going to be done for our future. Um, this is a great little community. I, I drive around the circle maybe twice a day, when it may be more, and I and I just shudder to think that something and and, and I I do feel that there's going to be and there should be some development. I certainly agree that some of the low buildings could could use some development. But when I when I think about looking at coming across the circle and seeing like for for example the Long and Foster or the Wells Fargo being built into and even if it's seventy feet. Uh, that's that that's just insane and to think about how you come around a beautifully restored fountain from a gorgeous neighborhood you come into our nice strip and then you see this monstrosity none of which will have any of the beautiful beautiful architecture that even those you know kind of common but nice looking the wells fargo bank and the long and foster are really nice looking buildings to have this monstrosity with no character it would just be a nightmare and then i, I also agree with uh, carol grunewald about you know right now stuff right i mean as far as i can tell if they're going to raise the, the height then of course people are going to start building and then you know then we're kind of stuck and and then i want to know let's say that you get like eight bids on this and someone gets picked to win right someone gets picked to win right 
who's going to manage the people who are allowed to live in the affordable? Like who chooses that? Is it the city or is it the actual uh, developer? Like how can we make sure we get school teachers, policemen, firemen, people that our neighborhood wants in there, right? Because that's the whole point of affordable housing. I just, I never really got a, got a full understanding of that. And by the way, I also think our current library and, and community center could easily be restored by a great architect, like even that great article that came out today by Shalom Baranis or yesterday. I mean, there are so many things that can be done. That Those buildings are built like tanks. They could be expanded upwards a little bit. They could be dug out a little bit more and they could be certainly made to look much nicer. And it's, and look at the current community center. All the, fl all the flashing is missing in the front. It's the weather's getting in there. It's wrecking the structure of the building. They can't even fix the flagpole. They can't even put up a new flag. I mean, it's a total disgrace. But anyway. Okay. Um, thanks, Steve. Let's go on to um, Steve, I mean, uh, Cheryl Barnes. Uh, Lisa, do you want to let a couple of the people who haven't said anything yet speak first? I'm happy to let them go. There, you've got a couple of people like, I don't know, um, Teresa Grana, Andrea McCabe, et cetera. I can wait until my second round. Uh, if that's or, I, or I can stop talk now. That's fine, too. <laughs> However <laughs> you can do it, I'm good. Okay. I just don't want you to cut me off before the end of the meeting. I need to say no. what I need to say. No, go Should on. Um, so a couple of things. The uh, surplus of public land, which is what we're talking about, at least with the commons part of this upzoning. Um, after the city surpluses it and disposes of it to the developer, you all don't have any control over it. Nobody has any control over it except for the executive, that is the mayor. That's my first point. Second point, um, you know, if you, if you look at the uh, Wisconsin Avenue situation with uh, housing, uh, Ward 3 Housing Justice, they are extremely irate over the Office of Planning RFP that came out for that quote unquote affordable housing. It has been a grave disappointment for those people who worked extremely hard to get what they thought was going to be workforce housing for families in the whole Wisconsin Avenue development. I urge everybody in the community to look at that disaster. It's not pretty. And those, the, the Ward 3 housing justice people are furious because of being so disappointed by what the city promised them and what they failed to deliver. And the, the third point that I have to offer is that when developers build to, as Carol Grunewald put it earlier, 100% of what they're allowed to build to, they build the most luxurious thing that they are allowed to build because they don't really care if anyone inhabit, inhabits that building or not. What they do, and this is why we have the vacancy rate all over downtown, all over the wharf development, everywhere in Washington, DC, where we have class A market rate development with a, a, a little bit of IZ housing thrown in. Developers get their funding by getting appraisals on those empty buildings, um, which they can take to the bank and get more funding to build more empty buildings. This is, I'm sorry, the Donald Trump model. And it's the every big developer model. They don't care if the buildings have retail in the, in the stores on the first floor. They don't care if they sell the condos on the floors two through seven. They don't care if they have renters. None of that matters. And this is the story throughout Washington, DC. You get small businesses displaced, you get low to moderate income dwellers displaced, and you get class A market rate apartments or condos or anything else, and they're vacant. The developers do not care because they can take that product to the bank, get an appraisal on the finished product and get a lot more cash 
based on the finished product. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and uh, okay, uh, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I'm just going in order. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, did you speak already or were you not able to come on? Um, I I did speak earlier. I was having trouble with my mic and then okay, go on. um there was the I deferred to Claudia Russell. Okay. If you remember. Um, thank you though. Um I, with respect to the comment by Commissioner Nash that he was confused by the seeming contradiction between zoning and the RFP, I, I'd like to posit that the RFP and zoning are inextricably entwined because people will build to whatever, as people have mentioned, to whatever the zoning ends up being. Uh, with that in mind, what the developers are telling members of the public, what they're telling members of the ANC is, is wonderful. It's just they're not bound to it because the only thing they're bound to is what they actually submit to the city in the RFP when the proposals are submitted. Um, and I say that with my background in, in government contracts. So Absolutely. I'm pretty sure that that's correct. Absolutely. Um, with respect to parking, uh, I mean, they could tell you can promise you anything. They, they just don't have to do it. They can say whatever they want to say. And the only time you'll know what they really are doing is when they actually submit the RFP. Um, with respect to parking, uh, the RFP for people who are hoping for parking, I would uh, remind you that the RFP gives extra credit for no parking. Right. You get more credit for less parking. And in fact, the RFP wants no parking at all for the common site. So um, if they're promising parking when they're talking to you, they're not necessarily um, going to be able to come through and get the points that they need to prevail in the RFP process. And lastly, um, and because it also partly relates to parking, I did spend part of my career as the disability rights coordinator for a federal agency. And I have to say, um, it, it is painful. I totally agree with Robin Miles McLean. Uh, the, it, it, the saying in the disability rights community is if you live long enough, you will become disabled. Two minutes are up. Can I just finish my point? Yeah, go on. I think that disability rights and the needs of people who have disabilities at all ages, uh, whether that's seniors, because it, it tends to increase with age, but there are plenty of people who have plenty of disabilities at, at much, much younger ages, if not even from birth. And those needs have been woefully um, not considered and disrespected in almost every undertaking that's been happening since I've been really tuned into this, which includes, you know, the bike lanes, you know, great if you're, great if you're able to do a bike, but if you're disabled and you can't, they don't seem to care about that. So I just think that we ought to be caring about the people in our community who are disabled and, and providing access as you're required to under law. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Susan P. Hi, just a couple of follow-up points. First to Commissioner Zeldin, when he said we're talking fear-based rather fact-based, that's not the case at all, and that's an unfair comment. I mean, if we're going to be fact-based, I, I don't see any reason why we would trust the city on this to manage this uh, to what we vote for in resolutions, because our every experience has been with this process that we've been informed late, the ANC hasn't been properly notified. The RFP was written as if it was for, um, written by developers. So they didn't take into, uh, into close reading what the community was asking for in the RFP. Um, so, and it's same thing with the bioretention spaces, you guys weren't notified properly for a year. Why would we trust the city on this? And then I agree with Elizabeth's point about developers will say anything now. I mean, they're seducing us. So they're giving us wonderful plans, but you know, maybe it includes a lot of parking spaces, but are they free? I, I've been seeing a lot of doctors downtown that are $20 an hour to park at. 
are they if it's all affordable housing are they going to make their money by charging people to park to go to the library or the community center why would we trust them um i'm sure they have great plans now but this is the time that you guys have leverage i mean peter before said that we were bringing up too much rfp stuff when we're talking about zoning isn't this the time that the anc has the leverage to negotiate on this and not compromise um early i mean what power will you really have to enforce it or to change the rfp which already didn't meet what your expectations were was anyone expecting the city to open them up to using part of the space for hotels so i i really encourage you first of all it is fact based to say we shouldn't trust the city on this because they haven't been trustworthy we shouldn't believe the developers first um options and offerings and i i want you to take very seriously the leverage you have now that you won't later thank you very much thank you okay andrea then Teresa, and um then we're going to go back to commissioners thank you so much a uh, number of people have commented on how wonderful it is to drive around Chevy Chase Circle and drive down Connecticut Avenue and they don't want to see any building along the avenue because they like the sociability. Uh, it's a different story if you're able to walk up the avenue. And if you're attending any of the meetings at the churches on the circle and wanting to walk home at night down Connecticut Avenue, which is desolate, up there with Wells Fargo on well, one side closed down and Long and Foster and then another uh, bank. So um, if there were more housing up there, I think we would have sociability. And you heard the statement about so many businesses uh, going under in the last few years and the little bakery and wine store went under. And she said, people just don't think of, of that stretch of the, the avenue is having businesses, even though she has a parking lot in back, it did nothing. So I would really encourage the increased zoning so that we have more people on the avenue, more sociability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think Teresa. Hi, hello. Um, I would just like to thank Bruce Sherman for um, his email this afternoon <clears throat> where he is listening to his constituents. And I would encourage you all to do that. I, I find it just amazing that we can have the survey and that individual commissioners can poll their uh, their areas and get the results that are not in favor of what many of you are supporting. And I think that is um, not fair to those of us who've spent time uh, working on this. And um, the other thing, I think <clears throat> the city, by benign neglect, is letting the community center and the library go to hell in a handbasket. There, the programs there are never advertised. The building is a, is falling down, as someone said. The the flashing is going, and I think that is inexcusable. And I think it's your role as commissioners to put some pressure on the Parks and Recreation Department to develop some. We should have a tutoring program there. We should have more more programs for seniors and some creative. Uh, um, things that are going on there. And you go up there and it's dead. And they're doing programs that they did in 1960 or 50. Nothing created. They do do a wonderful summer camp. It's one of the most popular in the region. And they do other things, but they need our support uh, before they tear it down. And of course, when the development goes through, if it does, where where are these young people going to go? Where are the seniors and where's the temporary space going to be? I, I you know, we don't have- Two minutes to run. And so I would 
I once again thank Bruce, and I'd also thank Michelle for documenting all the affordable housing that is being built and that <clears throat> I hope you uh, investigate and become aware of. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, oops. Commissioners? Um, any um, comment or feedback from the last round? And, and that's, we're just doing the two community rounds. So people with your hand raised, um, you can lure them. We're gonna go on to commissioners now. Um, Commissioner Gosselin, then Lynch. Yeah, I, I wanna note that most of the discussion, a great deal of the discussion tonight has been about the RFP and the communities. We need to make a decision, or maybe we don't. I hope we do make a decision about the zoning. Um, a lot of the discussion about both the community center and the zoning and about everything else to do with the city is about the many flaws of the city. And I'm not gonna dispute those, and I don't think other commissioners are gonna dispute many of those claims. The question is um, what to do about it. Now, Bruce Sherman, um, uh, had pointed to the survey that the full commission did and to a flash survey he did. And I agree that there is a great deal of fear about overdevelopment. And what the resolution that I advocate to pass tries to do about that is, um, is get the change the get the city to accept a, a lower height at the community center library it is easy to say oh but you could say no oh but you should embrace uh you know you should you, you you should do something about improving the existing community center library we did not set the terms for the thing this commission did not set the terms for, for what the city is proposing to do with zoning um, and uh, I suggest that we are trying our best to uh, to respond to the the, cons the deep concern about overdevelopment that you're seeing in these surveys. But I think the most effective route um, is not to say no, but to say 70 feet. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you. So I, I just have uh, two points to make initially. There's there's so much to say. Uh, one is that a reminder that even with the, the ratty state of the community center and library, I was there this weekend, every parking space was taken. There were high school kids uh, working at the community center when I was talking with the community, the people that run the community center. Um, the library was filled up. Kids were on the playground. Uh, the pickleball courts were used up. People were sitting on benches, having meetings, walking around. Um, so it it is used extensively. There are over, I think there's around 20 programs, uh, notably the fencing program that takes place at the community center. So my stance has always been that the library, the community center, and the outdoor space uh, should all remain at the same capacity that they currently are at. To my next point, um, to correct something that was mentioned last meeting, the tallest building from the Chevy Chase Circle to uh, Legation is the M&T Bank building. And I, I recommend that everybody walk by it, get a sense of it. That building is 40 feet. Um, the community center building is 40 feet. This is according to the Office of Planning. The library is just over 30 feet. Um, so when you have a, a sense of those buildings, um, taking that M&T bank building and then uh, possibly doubling it, um, that's, a, that's a striking building, um, whichever way you're um, moving on this. Uh, my, my other piece that I'm very uh, cognizant of is that on this commission, there's been um, a strong reaction to the incredibly tall houses that have been built in the neighborhood. Um, you know, Commissioner Zeldin, you mentioned the story of Tony Kornheiser moving out of his house because of that height. 
uh, my constituents, the neighbors on Northampton Street, have that very concern about the height of buildings uh, adjacent to their homes. And I think we owe it to them and ought to respect uh, their concerns on the height there. And I think you and the city ought to be able to meet many of the goals that are shared by everyone in maintaining the community center capacity, the library capacity, the outdoor space capacity, and potential affordable housing if the height is focused on what is currently the uh, community center building and not where the, the library building is. Uh, how you reflect that in the zoning, I think is very difficult, but I think it's something we ought to attempt. And barring those sort of several main points that I've, I've emailed the commission about and sent out in my newsletter, uh, I, I would not be able to support this resolution as is. And I think there's so much more to say about the process and the trust in the city and the, you know, walk up and down Connecticut and Wisconsin, and it is littered with sites and buildings that are empty and projects that uh, are not going with the full, the expected affordable housing that many affordable housing advocates have, have lobbied for. So I think the city has a, a, a lot to do to make up for um, some of the deficits they uh, have had in attaining some of this housing. Thank you. Commissioner Nash, then Sherman. Yeah. Um, I I would uh, I, I would like to uh, say that I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Gosselin's uh, general points uh, that he just stated. And uh, I would like us to come to a vote. Uh, it's quarter to nine. And uh, I think we've already lost uh, Commissioner Ferguson and Commissioner Zeldin. And uh, I'm going to have to leave at nine uh, in 15 minutes. We've we've heard from the community uh, again and again and again in this meeting and previous meetings. Uh, I think it's time for us to uh, make a vote and and uh, move on. That's it. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, Commissioner Sherman. Actually, we've had pressures all the time to discuss the resolution and the, and the fine points of it, to be honest. We've taken a lot of community input, as we should do. Um, I think we're making a big mistake not using the survey as leverage with the Zoning Commission. Uh, indeed, we have an abundant body of data to tell the Zoning Commission that our community is very concerned about overdevelopment. It's as simple as that. It's a development issue. Um, and it seems to me that we're burying our greatest tool, our greatest point of leverage. We previously had, of course, on the RFP, that's a separate matter, identified 60 feet as a height limit due to the data that came off the survey. Now we have, at least for my single member district, additional data, but let's go back to the ANC survey and even go back to the 2019 survey, which I have recalled many times in these conversations, but every time we have these conversations, somehow that essential data point is lost. When the ANC fields the survey in 2019, only seven to 9% of respondents, and there were 680 or thereabouts, said they favored buildings that were six stories or taller, six plus stories. We have to recall that. That was at the founding of this entire initiative. The task force that the ANC put together then to propose amendments, revisions to the comprehensive plan, took that information and did nothing with it. They ignored it. The community was very clear then with respect to senior housing, affordable housing, and workforce housing, their height concerns. And it wasn't about the housing, it was about overdevelopment. And we're here in the same place with the community saying the same things. And I would urge my colleagues on the commission to heed the community's views. We had on this call tonight about 65 people or there about 60 at the peak, whatever it was, and there were seven, seven of us on the commission. So let's call, we had 50, roughly 50 people on the call. That means there were 14,950 people who were not on the call. And the only way we've reached them recently has been to issue a survey and let everybody know they can take it. And they did and they told us what their preferences were. The credibility of this institution 
is at risk when we consistently ignore what they're telling us. So I think we have to be very clear about that. And then to the point now, use what they've told us as leverage. Could I, could I respond? Sure. Um, Bruce, I, I said earlier, and I think um, Ron Kahn was right, and I think you were right, that the, that the survey needs to be mentioned uh, and uh, summarized in this, uh, in this resolution. The question is what we do about the proposal that is going to come up um, Monday before the Zoning Commission. Now, we could say nothing and dither. I just want to remind everybody of a little history, going back to the small area planning. During the, at the end of the small area planning process, notwithstanding the fact that I had been a sharp critic of the, of the entire process, I tried to craft a compromise uh, proposal. I worked three months on it. It went down to defeat. And all of the complaint, arguably all of the complaints we've heard tonight grow out of the fact we would, would we didn't take a stand then. And I would argue that just letting this go by um, is, uh, is going to leave us in the very same position again, that we need to take some stand here. We need to try to do something to address the concerns that are voiced by people here tonight and in those in those in the survey uh, itself about overdevelopment. Is it enough? Does it satisfy everybody? Does it satisfy most people? No, but it's a step in the right direction and it's something we can do. And we might, we might make a difference when the Zoning Commission acts. But we're not going to make any difference if we don't act tonight and the Zoning Commission uh, takes up this matter um, uh, on Monday at four o'clock. Commissioner Lynch. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you, Commissioner Gosselin, that we should address this. Uh, we absolutely should. Um, it, just to get back to the sort of the two big sticking points for me, if we were to take, and I, I said this in the, the ANC email, I'm not sure anybody responded, but if you took the 33 foot building and added 27 feet, that's the library. You now have 60, which we have asked for. And Bruce has said he would stick with that because we've already asked for it. If you took the community center, which is 40 feet and added 20 feet to get to 60, you now have an extra 47 feet of building, which is larger than the two current buildings that are there. My point to everyone was that if with that 47 foot extra building space, if the city and the developers are not able to achieve affordable housing. And when people talk about affordable housing as a side note, I think we should be very critical and questioning of what that means. Because I've heard a developer say it'll be, you know, the the, the smallest with 80% 80, 80 MFI and or just for the elderly. Um, I think a lot of the hopes and dreams of what the affordable housing at this site may not be realized. Um, but just back to numbers, we could stick with what our resolutions have said prior, and, which is to maintain, and I think what the community wants is to maintain that green space uh, to, to reach the housing height that we have already called for. And we would still be adding essentially a building that is bigger than the buildings that are both there right now. As another point, I, I live at the Lorraine Apartments. Uh, there are 93 units here. I recommend everybody walk by uh, the Lorraine Apartments and look at what 93 units looks like. And then imagine adding outdoor space. Imagine adding community center. Imagine adding a library. And just with common sense, see if that's possible. Um, so a couple things to consider. And I wonder if the commission would be interested in taking up uh, those two points, which are one, we maintain the 40% lot coverage, not 60, and that we ask that the buildings don't go higher than 60. And then I would add on a, a sort of like a third one for my constituents that the, the most height be concentrated close to that McKinley corner. Oh, 
Uh, Chair, do you want to speak? Because uh, ultimately, what we do at this point depends on you. Yeah. So, um, from my understanding, I, two things before I give my opinion. I think Commissioner Lynch offered a friendly amendment. So I want to clarify that. Is that what you're asking, Peter? No, I'm asking about what your view is on the-, the Peter, I'm, I mean, Peter Lynch. It sounded yeah. like at the, end of his, at the end of his comments, he was offering a friendly amendment. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. I mean, if we're looking to vote together to send something to the Office of Planning uh, on Monday, and, and we all want to get together on, on saying something, those would be two things that I expressed earlier that that I would have to sign off on and agree to, and that yeah, so basically a resolution or, or a friendly amendment. But I mean, I think we should well, talk uh, about it, see where uh, people stand and uh, see what could give and not give and where this ends up. Okay, I'm sorry. So, can I ask a question, Lisa? Peter, sure. your Peter Lynch, your friendly amendment then essentially is the prior resolution what is there anything in the prior resolution that would be different than what you're proposing here i mean yes i'm not, no. I'm not criticizing you i'm just saying you have no. a 60 foot in the prior you have the open space in the prior what is yes. it that is being added i'm just trying to get clarity i'm not criticizing i'm just trying to get clarity of what is the change from 60 from the past resolution to what you're proposing in this resolution. I think the language around outdoor space is very different. It, it talks about, I, I think it's just too muddled. The I would say the current 40% lot coverage, keep that, no more. And what's the language of the prior resolution? Michael, just to be clear, we're talking about a resolution. It's, it's, it's too confusing and there's too many, people have all sorts of, is, is the, parking lot outdoor space is the you know the pavement that people don't use for pickleball is that outdoor space is the you know the the side lot little you know so it's there's just too many people with varying definitions of what outdoor space is i well, think then how how would your how would your language make it less confusing if you're saying 40 percent outdoor space the definition of outdoor space still remains no 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 no, no. it's the lot coverage so you Currently, the library and the community center take up 40% of that space. For the community to think about this too, take, or for all of us, take one of those buildings, cut it in half, and then add it to the rest of the site. And that's what you're losing with 60% uh, lot coverage. Ready? Okay. Um... So, Zildan, what I'm saying is, Keep the lot coverage, which is just where the community center is, just where the library is, 40%. I guess I'm just, I just—I have to look at the, the the existing resolution to say, what does what does it say about lot coverage? What does the prior resolution say about lot coverage? Uh, uh, I'll try to pull yeah. it up right now. Yeah, if you could pull that up. While you're pulling that up, let me um just kind of give where I'm going. Um, I've tossed this um original resolution the current resolution back and forth i've been on both sides of voting no voting yes um one of the things that um i would like to ask uh definitely peter is kind of get a better understanding why we're not sticking to the 60 percent um the more i uh, i'm sorry the 60 feet which was in our original resolution the more I think about it um, and hear people, I really do think we should be consistent with that. Um, we said 60 feet in our last resolution to the city. Um, I think we should try to honor that as much as possible. Um, now we're going back up to 70 foot, whether we say one zone or two zones. Why are we deviating from the 60 feet? If we can command a majority for uh, changing, going one zone 60 feet, I'll vote. For it. Mm -hmm. 
Bruce, you're on silent. Okay. So, um, All right. Lisa, can I just make a data point? Well, hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, I understand the data points. I'm not. No, this is a new one. I'm sorry. I was going to reinforce your, your view that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. Only 21% of people on the survey supported a building that was 70 feet. Only 13% supported a building that was 80 feet. So to be to support your point, even more so on the 60 foot limit would reflect the community's views. So I'm just I'm just reinforcing what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. And you know, let me just say because I saw a comment that just popped up about the reduction in affordable housing. We all knew when we took that last or we made that last resolution and we voted on it. So I'm just going to tell you how I feel. Everybody knows I'm a big affordable housing advocate. When I took that vote to reduce the height to 60 feet, I knew as well as all of us knew that is a reduction in affordable housing. We know that. The reason why I took that vote was to compromise with the community because I know that the community does not want sky high buildings. I understand that. Um, and that was my way to compromise with the community. So I want to make sure that um, I think it's important for us as a commission, if, and I, I take that vote and what I voted on seriously, and that comes will come down to the vote I take for which project I support. I'm going to support a project that is based on what we voted on in that resolution. That's going to that's going to be my bottom line. I want a project that comes very very close to what we voted on. And I think as a commission, if we took that resolution seriously, we should continue that, you know, in what we do and what we vote for in the future. Um I didn't bring that up on email to you guys. Um, so maybe that's my fault for not doing that. But I do think it's important that we um, that we consider that vote and that, you know, we understand what it does to affordable housing. I mean, it, it definitely is going to reduce it if, um, you know, developer development teams can't build up to maximum height. But that's, I think, a promise and a commitment we made to the community that we should probably stick with. I think if we go with 70 feet, we're kind of we're we're kind of backtracking on that promise. As I say, I'm happy to take the that change. I I cannot take a 40 percent lot coverage up and down the avenue. Um, that I think would be that would be a a, a change that would go too far. In Peter, I, it, I'm I'm focused with the 40 percent lot coverage on the Civic Core. Which is just maintaining the lot coverage that is there now. So the well, so I, I at that point I'm I basically need to bow out because I've written two versions of a resolution. Well, I guess we could take the the original resolution I wrote uh, and uh, and accept it with an, your friendly your amendment to make it instead of eighty feet all in. 60 feet. You know, so we're going back to his two zone proposal. In other words, the proposal I made is just make one zone for all of Upper Connecticut Avenue. Um, if you want to distinguish the community center library site, then we can go back to the two zone version of the, of the resolution I wrote. And I, for the sake of trying to find it, I think we're going to use Commissioner Nash, Commissioner Ferguson. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. They can speak for themselves, but I do think that um, we're demonstrating vividly there is not uh, not any uh, comedy here, or not any. Uh, uh... What was the lot coverage on the original resolution we submitted? Be, the last one. You mean in December? Yeah. I don't think we spoke to lot coverage. Yeah. So I'm I'm not prepared to vote on a 40% lot coverage for civic core zoning or commercial zoning. I I won't support that. So I I would have to drop out after that. I I think and and why? Because uh, it that is, you know, I I really take the point of folks that have mentioned that that is a driver of community cohesion. Uh, being able to meet people there, ha having that space, 
ha having the pickleball court, the tennis court, the basketball court, the kids' playground, the garden, the places to sit. These that's not insignificant. And we've been told over and over again, and I know from personal experience that it, it's deeply important for the community. And so I I I couldn't support something that goes past that, I think. But I didn't ask that's, I mean, just for me, the reduction in height is a significant reduction in affordable housing. And I, I the 40% lot coverage is going to reduce it to nothing. Um, and I think, you know, that's where my line is. So um, I think I've, you know, with the 60% the height, that's six, 60 feet is about as almost as far as I can go. It wouldn't be nothing because I want to say, can I can I uh, jump in here? I I'm with uh, Commissioner Lynch in that uh, I I and I was under the misapprehension that uh, Commissioner Gosselin's uh, resolution would preserve existing lot coverage on the Civic Core. If that is not the case, uh, to me, lot coverage is is more important than building height. Uh, and so I'm OK with 70 feet if we uh, preserve the same amount of green space. If we're going to lose green space in order to have lower buildings, then I'm not going to be voting for that resolution. So, so let, could I just say, I think that, um, Jim, uh, uh, the. Uh, so I don't I think what we're hearing here, we could hear from Michael, I don't think there's a majority for anything. I mean, yeah. So what we have is we have Lynch and Sherman Wait. on forty on forty percent at the community center lot coverage at the community center. We have Gore and Goslin at um, sixty percent uh, and a willingness on Goslin's part to go to sixty feet, but from seventy, but not from sixty percent lot coverage to forty. We haven't heard from Zeldin and and uh, and um, and uh, uh, Zach is not on. I don't think on the line. So I don't think there's a majority. Just to be clear, I haven't given you my exact statement on what I would support on lot coverage. So you finish and we'll come back. Well, uh, so I mean, I a, Peter, could I throw out a quick reminder? Yeah. I, I think whatever we say, um, it, it what OP will decide to do is not going to be necessarily dictated by what we say. So, you know, we say 40% lot coverage, they may say, okay, that's interesting, we'll go 50. Or we say 60 uh, feet height, they may say, we couldn't care less, we're going whatever they want. So maybe to approach this in, in what we need and want and think is the right thing to do, and then let OP sort out that later. Well, I, I, Peter, on this score, we have a, just a very different view about, I mean, to, to, we play at this game within a context, and the context has already been defined by a long, multi-year process of the small area plan, and then the, the, the rocky conversations of the last year. I, 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 I just don't think it's realistic to, to go to 40%. Um, you're right, they may not listen to us, but on the subject of not listening to us, just, uh, I mean, on that on that basis, we might as well just give up voting for anything. Uh, uh, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable thing to do here. I don't think you're going to get a majority, and it is uh, 908. So, I mean, uh, uh, I don't see the majority, but Bruce, I mean, you... you, you I mean, uh, yeah, let's hear so, from Bruce. Yeah, so I... Um... Uh, harking back to our resolution that had to do with the RFP, to be very clear, not the Zoning Commission hearing and the Office of Planning Zoning Amendments, but just to hark back to that, 60 feet, I'm good with the 60 feet as uh, as before. Um, I could live with the 60% lot coverage at the Community Center Library site. I would want 60 feet, if we're talking about this, to be the same standard up and down the avenue to address the height concerns that our community has about tall buildings, period. It's not only with regard to the community center library site. Um, and um, I'm prepared to support that with the zoning commission and to marshal the research data to back that up. I would say, Peter uh, Goslin, 
that we put forth here what we believe is the best possible case, obviously representing our constituents. We give it to the city, we give it to the zoning commission, we inform the office of planning at the hearing on Monday and let the chips fall where they may. They're gonna do what they're going to do. But we put forward what we think is the right thing. And uh, let's put this in the category of you just never know what will happen. Okay, so let me just understand. Is there is there a majority for one zone, 60 feet, 60% lot coverage? Um, yeah, you know, just, to clear, just to be clear, that's maximum 75% lot coverage on the non-civic core stretch of the avenue, right? That's what it is currently. But if you're saying we would, we go 60% all over. We can leave, okay. we, we can leave it. We, I mean, what we have for the non-civic core site as proposed by LP is 60% for uh, residential. Listen, I... Chris Vaden, I, I, I misrepresented that. 60% for residential, unless there's a, affordable housing, in which case it's 75%, and no limit on non-residential. We want to accept that. I think it sounds to me like there might be a, a majority in 60-60. There is. Okay. Now, just, uh, I mean, I am ha I'm happy to do the following. Accept that as an amendment to the one zone proposal agree with Bruce to put in a summary of the survey results and his flash survey results. Um, uh, and uh, is there other, something other, I mean, I, I can strengthen some of the language around park, the importance of parking. Because I mean, I, so Robin, uh, Robin's point, I mean, I, I do say it, it recognizes the need, especially among the communities post 65, Residents, I could add disability, uh, disabled too. Um, th does does that command a majority? Um, uh, we haven't heard from Michael. Um, uh, we haven't heard from Zach, who just came back on the line. Um, so let's hear from Michael. So, in speaking to the developers that that I spoke to, that are thinking about bidding, the two that I spoke to, one was a um, affordable housing nonprofit, and one was the uh, Vicki Davis at Travel Crow. Both of their proposals, I think, would fall within 60-60. It might be a little bit close on the height 60. I think they were, the one that I saw was at like 62 or 63, but I think that's a, a, a difference without distinction. 60% um, lot coverage, I think, gets us more green space um, than we have presently. It allows for the development of the property in such a way that we get a rooftop play field, we get a um, solar panel, we get underground parking, we get more, as I said, more green space. So I, I, I can live with 60 and 60 because of the, because the two people that I spoke to, the two companies that I spoke to both said that they want 100% affordability, which they define as 30 to 80 with a medium point of, of 50. And they can get um, a, a substantial amount of, of housing within that footprint. And I think that what we have accomplished by doing what we're doing is a fair compromise where is always defined as nobody is completely happy, um, but we have something that I think we can all live with and uh, to the Susan P's comment that it's our legacy, which I don't agree with. But if it is our legacy, um, then I think we've we've made a good faith effort to say we want these multiple things. Not everyone is happy, but we can we're 60, 60, single member, single district, um, I think makes sense to me. Could I just before we hear from Zach say something to Jim Nash, which is with regard to open space. Remember that I, I believe this is correct that the that the lot coverage figures for the current community center um, and library uh, that, that we have room to play with if, if, with the parking lot to expand green space if developers hear us on the issue of needing parking but needing the green space so that 
I don't think you're going to, the, the, the images of squeezed and, uh, um, and damaged green space, I think is, I, I, I think can be handled with this, with the space we have, even at 60% lock up. Um, anyways, the, 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 trying to get Jim's vote um, on that. I think you get, I think Peter, you actually get more green space. I think you actually <laughs> how, get more. How can you say you get space? more by taking away 20% of the current open space? Because you build over the parking lot. Yeah, yeah the make, parking lot currently, RFP the parking is lot currently the counts as your driveway. Commissioners, one is at it? a time, please. One at a time. Calls for the parking, the current parking lot to be turned into a driveway, like a, yeah. a service driveway. So this this well, idea I'm of I'm just that, telling you, Peter Lynch, that in the plan in the plans that I saw. Maybe your idea, but it's not linked to any facts that we know of. It's sure. in the plans that were presented to us in the phone calls yeah. that we had with the developers. That's what they are proposing. That's they, that's they, the basis upon which I say it. If that has mm -hmm. no, it's not rooted in any contract fact or yeah. anything. They could say whatever they want to us. Yeah. And did the, okay. the, the, um, the RFP on that subject. So the, 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 they, they made changes already in, the, in how that area is treated. But look, I mean, it's in, it was a, it was a first. Who has? What are you talking about, Peter? Dempet. Dempet yeah. is already. The DEM has already changed the requirements for that back area. Uh, um, they, I mean, they did it like a couple months ago. I, I, yeah. I'm not saying that this, this assures anything, but on the issue of not assuring anything, on that basis, you know, we, we should just hang it up and go home, which I'd be great to do anyway. Right. right. So, I mean, uh, you know, so I, I just, you know. I'm not saying that, but I, I, I'm saying that you can add more green space with 20%, which is half the current lot coverage, half of the current lot coverage that is there now, and saying you can get more green space with 20% more, just uh, I'm having a hard time understanding that one. Okay, let's go to Zach Ferguson. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, and just for the record, I've, I haven't spoken to any developers. Um, you know, I heard someone say when we talked to them, um, I haven't spoken to any yet, um, or plan to. Um, my question was, I'm trying to get caught up. Thanks for letting me back in. Um, this 60, I'm hearing something about a 60 foot single zone. Is that what's on the, before the commission right now being proposed by Commissioner Gosselin? When you say 60 yeah. feet, does that include, you know, when I talk to people about building, you know, like usually most people aren't thinking mechanical penthouses. They're thinking about what they can see from the sidewalk. Are you talking about 60 feet, including uh, mechanical? I think we're talking about 60 feet all in. So mechanical. Um, so so right now, the MU3 zone, you can build the 55 feet, including that. So you're talking about adding, having the ANC advise this, the DC saying, we think five additional feet for our, the whole corridor is what makes the most, is, you know, the views of the community is the best for this, all, all the, that's what you're saying? That's right. And the, and the, the city's view is in the rest of Connecticut Avenue zone. They, the OP proposal is for 70 feet, and for the community center library feet zone, it would be for 80. And the, a resolution along the lines of this, a modified uh, document that, that uh, based on my what I've written, basically get across the board 60, and that's all in with all that, uh, with all a possible um, uh, bonuses and penthouses and so on. So we'd be talking about a change of five feet. Allowance again. This no one is mandated to change their building. It's just what you're allowed to build would change by five feet. Is what you're saying? What we would advise. That's right. Okay, just making sure I'm understanding. Um, I'll just say something. You know, um, talking about neighbors. You know, um, I talked to a lot of parents. You know, and you know, I was at the. Uh, the Civic Core playground this weekend. I talked to some nice parents. Um, I, I was late, running late today because I was at the uh, Taekwondo at the Chevy Chase Arcade or the area we're talking about. And, you know, we don't talk about like Florida area ratios or mechanical penthouses with their parents. You know, we talk a lot about kids and, and the future generations. And I think a concern I hear from neighbors uh, of all ages too is, are, well, you know, we hope our kids are having a great childhoods here. You know, we hope they love Chevy Chase. They love growing up here. But the housing market message that they get is, well, 
I hope you had a good childhood, but when you, you know, when you're ready to start a family and, you know, go out into the world, there's no housing here for you. You're, you know, hope you had a good childhood, but try Manassas, try Centerville, try somewhere else where there's, there's enough housing. So I work, I think that's just, you know, it's not technical feedback I have. It's just a general concern. Also, the other message is, oh, okay, maybe if you really want to live here, well, the median home price is like 1.2 million. You know, if you're looking for a, you know, you're starting a family, you want to have two or three bedrooms. Um, the other message it sends is don't be a teacher, don't be a nurse, don't be a police officer, you know, be a hedge fund manager if you really want to live in this community. Um, that, that's just a, a concern I have. And, you know, no, no one single policy or proposal is going to change that. That's it's a huge issue that's not going to be solved by any advisory board or even a government policy. But that's something I, I think about when I think about um, the housing issues and what I've heard from neighbors. Um, in addition to, of course, countless hours of, you know, this is our fifth special meeting on this topic. So we've uh, read, you know, you can go to the Zoning Commission, read all of our neighbors' comments, um, SAP. There's, you know, years of data, but that's just something I've, I've thought about recently uh, from my recent conversations. Okay, should I move something and we just take a vote and see where we are? So I call for the vote. Well, let me just say, I, what we are, what I understand us to be voting on is a one zone, 60 foot all in um, height limit, 60% lot coverage. And I agree to add a summary of the survey results, strengthen the language on parking. Um, uh, th that's the, that's the, what I understand to be the resolution we're voting on. I move it. Do I have a second? I second. And Commissioner Sherman, as secretary, can you do a voice roll call vote since uh, yes. not all the commissioners are on the screen? I'm sorry, this is Robin Miles McLean, and I apologize for breaking in, but you keep talking about one or two zones. Does that mean that the RF1 parcels are not part of either of these resolutions that you're talking about? Why is it? It's a great a question, Robin, it's a great Hang question a because Hang the way that this Hang is. Hang on a minute, folks. Um, Robin, I'm going to let that question be answered, but I do want you to know that it's your comment is definitely out of order. Once the commission calls for um, the vote, the vote is supposed to happen. There's no discussion after that. But um, who, which commissioner? Commissioner Lynch, did you want to clarify that or Commissioner Goslin? Goslin or Lynch? Well, I just want to clarify that we have had 40 minutes as a commission to because a lot of times emails don't get responded to. I, I've sent several, other people have sent several that don't get responded to. We're not having these discussions uh, prior. And we are now talking about a huge zoning issue on Connecticut Avenue, on the Civic Corps, um, as mentioned on those two other portions. We were not properly notified by OP, as we have attested to. And so as a commission, debating, discussing, talking about all of these different um, side lot, occupancy, height, so on and so forth, uh, we, we we began, what, 845, 830? Yeah. Um, so, so do you have an answer to her question? Because we have called yes, for the because vote. she's frustrated that we are suddenly I, I get it. What's the answer to her question? That she's, that we are not giving this uh, the due consideration it ought to be given for the uh, incredible change it's going to make. And I'm not opposing the change that is necessarily coming, but to suddenly do one fell swoop resolution, and that's the only thing that we say, is just, we, we didn't have to be in this situation, uh, but here we are. And so I, I recognize your frustration. I share it. And, and the community should know that we didn't have to be in this situation and spending about 30 minutes uh, weighing all of these issues as a commission. You okay. deserve better. We are, we are out of order, commissioners. Perfect. The vote has been called for. Now, I'm trying to exercise as much patience as possible. But we have called for the vote. We are in the middle of a vote. You okay, Commissioner Gosselin, please proceed with your vote. Let me just clarify that you wanted me to clarify Robin's point. The RF yeah, yeah. zone is in there. Those small, those small residential uh, zones are in there uh, in the resolution as it now stands. I mean, uh, 
people want to remove them, that's another thing. But I, th th they are in there. So, so uh, I, uh, I call for the vote. I mean, it, it's a, it's sixty feet, sixty percent lot coverage, one zone from Livingston Street to the Circle. Um, but uh, Peter, we just had commissioner. Lisa. We had commissioner. Hang on, Commissioner Zeldin. Commissioner Sherman was um, getting ready to take the roll call. Is there any other discussion? I just have one question, which is the parking lot stuff still stands separate. We're talking about the commercial buildings and the and the civic center. The parking lot thing that's in your resolution is is unchanged. I'm going to strengthen it and say that. Yeah, but I mean, but it's we, you're not building 60 feet on the parking lots. Oh, the, the zoning allows building on on the C would allow building on the CVS location. The end, the PNC bank location and the back of Safeway. They're very, they're small, and these are residential structures, no more than thirty-five feet tall, except by special exception. So, I mean, uh, we're clearly, if they built there, we're going to have to do something about parking. The city is going to have to do something, but I don't. Right, but I'm, what I'm saying, Peter, just for clarification, is, is as you've written it in the current resolution ar around those spots, that's staying the same. That's staying the same. That's all I wanted to know. Sorry. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay. Commissioner um, Sherman, can you do as secretary a roll call vote? Because not all commissioners are on the screen. I certainly can in no particular order. Commissioner Ferguson. No. Commissioner Goslin. Yes. Commissioner Zeldin. Yes. Commissioner Gore. Yes. Commissioner Nash. No. Commissioner Lynch. No. Commissioner Sherman, yes. So we have, if I can count here correctly. Four to three, four to three the motion carries. Four so four to three, motion carries. Okay. Could I say one thing quickly just about process? I'm yes. getting... Well, I wanted to go back to that. And I wanted to, you know, just make sure what was out of order is we were voting on the motion. So now that we've taken that vote, there seems to be some discussion on process. If you guys want to make comments on the process, you know, now is appropriate time to do so. What I meant by process is that I'm going to get on a plane to Chicago to hear my son give a PhD. <laughs> I will I will work on this. I will take my computer and work on this, but it may not be until Monday afternoon that I get uh, a, 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 a cleaned up draft around to you. Uh, and and then we've got to get it. No, that can't be. I have to get it. No, 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 no. Well, well Saturday morning. Yeah, we need it. Yeah, we need it before. <laughs> okay. Definitely. I'll be in transit tomorrow. I will work on it tomorrow night or Saturday morning and get it around to you so that we get it in. I have reserved time to testify and I can do that or I can give you my time. You can testify because you know I'm going to be out in the field, but can you please text me and Bruce so that we can get it signed off on? Don't email, please text. Okay, I understand. Okay, that's the process I wanted to talk about. Uh, this resolution says that we, are, we may call for a multi-commission um, challenge to the procedural rules, um, uh, and I think that stays. I, I I submit that at 9:28, after this complicated process, we don't want to talk about a process resolution. Now that challenge survives um, the, the zoning commission's vote. It's a separate matter. We just use the zoning commission defects in notifying us as an example of why the procedural rules are not good ones and cut the A and C out of the process. We can do that separately and I advocate we do it separately. It's mentioned here, but it doesn't say we're gonna do it right away, so, okay. 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 Any other comments or questions, commissioners? I just hope we get in the habit of having resolutions that the community can see that are the same the night of and they could vote it on in the past in due time. We need, we need to work on that. But it sounds like whatever resolution is coming ahead is very different than what the community has seen. And we seem to be doing that over and over again. Peter, can 
I just say that many times you say, we don't know this, we don't know that. And you know, you're right. The community, Peter, the community doesn't know. We don't, we don't know, the community doesn't know. But if we don't act by Monday, we, we're, we're leaving ourselves out of the game. And you, you know, and I would just say also, at the, the non-responses and the lack of discussion, that's the, that's all part of this enormous meeting, rush the last, at the midnight hour. One at a time, one at a time, commissioners. Please let each other finish speaking. I'm just Please saying, be respectful. Let each other finish speaking. Go on, Gosselin. I just say at the last meeting, I advocated that the meeting be devoted to commissioners talking among themselves about where we were, because I faced the uncomfortable task of trying to draft a resolution, not knowing where everybody was. And we didn't get, but a, and the tape will show this, a small way into that meeting before you in particular said, oh, well, we got to listen to the community. And we did. So that- That's the, not accurate, Peter. Is the fact is- the I, did, I did not offer up that. That's not accurate. Absolutely. And so again, we have to check these- we'll watch the tape. We'll watch the tape. False statements, it's it's becoming tiring. May I ask you just a quick process question as to who's testifying on Monday, if anyone is? I, awesome. I've read, awesome. okay, I, I've also registered to testify. So Peter, if you want to talk ahead of time or whatever, I'm happy to do that. I'll tell you something, what would be really good is I'm flying back. I literally would have to do the testimony in the airport. If, if I end up getting back in time, I've got plenty of time to do it. But if, I, if there's even a small delay, why don't I text you and say, we'll, we'll, we'll work on some some uh, uh, language over the weekend. And then I, either I'll pass it to you or I'll, you either get the football or I get the football. So, um, so uh, Peter, are you testifying on behalf of the commission or just restating what was voted on here tonight or testifying on behalf of yourself? Well, the idea would be that I'm testifying one of us, Sherman or Gosselin, would testify on behalf of the commission. We're trying to present this, what we just voted on. I mean, or, or both of us can testify on behalf of the commission to emphasize different points because we're only, we're only going to get what three to five minutes, which is hardly anything. So, right. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll coordinate. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank commissioners. You. Thank you, community members. Thank you, Peter Gosselin. <laughs> Good night. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody.